Freedom Day is also November 9th, the day that the Berlin Wall came down, liberating millions of Europeans from the shackles of the Soviet Empire. Well, there is a great deal of focus on this day on the uh, military and economic reasons for the Soviet collapse and the dramatic political and diplomatic events of the summer of 1989. The victory was a spiritual awakening, a spiritual uprising in a real practical and immediate sense that Ronald Reagan and Pope John Paul II understood this from the beginning and set themselves to encouraging and leading the spiritual uprising there can be no doubt of, as demonstrated in this morning's Weekly Standard essay by Newt Gingrich, Callista Gingrich, and Vince Haley. Uh, our uh, session today is titled, The Victory of the Cross, How Spiritual Renewal Helped Topple the Berlin Wall. We will begin with a talk uh, and uh, I think a little presentation uh, by Newt Gingrich, the former Speaker of the House, a fellow at AEI and the Hoover Institution, omnipresent political phenomenon on issues ranging from oil drilling to health care to the legislative developments of the day. But Newt is also something more, something that was once customary but is less so today, a politician who in his private life is a seriously religious man but who does not make religious belief an upfront part of his political platform, although his religion certainly underlies and influences that platform. In his public political pronouncements, he customarily uses the ecumenical term spirituality. Uh, this is a large part of the uh, uh, Gingrich uh, oeuvre. Uh, the department is represented uh, by uh, the two movies and books, Rediscovering God in America, by Newt Gingrich and Callista Gingrich. Uh, the second edition, focusing on our early uh, political national heritage, uh, has just come out, and uh, both book and uh, DVD are for sale in the ante room. Uh, this is the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, we like uh, commerce, uh, so I'm happy to say that of the total Gingrich oeuvre of 20 books, uh, now uh, officially 11 of them have been New York Times uh, bestsellers. Uh, and the latest edition, which will come out uh, shortly and which we will be talking about today, today is a sort of a sneak preview, also by Newt Gingrich and Callista Gingrich and by executive producer uh, Vince Haley, Nine Days That Changed the World. Newt will be joined in today's commentary first by Bob McEwen. Bob is the chairman of Renewing American Leadership. He was a colleague of Newt's in the House of Representatives in the 1980s and early 1990s. He played more than an incidental uh, role uh, in the events we are talking about uh, today. Uh, in August of 1989, he was in uh, Poland along with uh, Senator Bob Dole uh, as an official uh, representative to the elections there. Following the elections, the new Prime Minister of Poland uh, met uh, with his first foreign dignitaries, uh, Representative McEwen and Senator Dole, while the Soviet representative cooled his heels in the ante room. Subsequently, in his uh, congressional career and afterwards, he has played an important role in the uh, parting uh, uh, death spasms of the uh, Soviet uh, Union. Uh, and in protecting the liberties of Eastern Europeans since then. Uh, finally, uh, Vince Haley, a former colleague of mine at AEI, is now Vice President for Policy at American Solutions for Winning the Future, uh, one part of the uh, Newt Gingrich uh, juggernaut. Uh, he uh, was a contributing uh, author of Newt's uh, uh, bestseller, Real Change, uh, moving from the world that fails to the world that uh, works. And he is associate producer of Nine Change, Nine Days That uh, Change the World, which we will be hearing a little bit more about this afternoon. Uh, with that, we will begin with uh, Newt Gingrich. A warm welcome, please. Let me say, first of all, I want to thank Chris, who uh, has been my mentor and guide uh, from the time I stepped down and he allowed me to come over and be uh, part of the AEI family 
and uh, he has continued to try to advise me as we go through this intellectual, uh, spiritual journey of trying to understand where we are and where we're going. I, I think this is a fascinating day to hold a discussion about what happened 20 years ago and why. And I think that it's particularly important to challenge some of the current patterns of how people see the world. I, I noticed Newsweek, uh, which has um, the American Embassy evacuation in Saigon on the cover. Now, the, art, the, the, the title of the article is actually not nearly as offensive as the first description I had, which is how we could have won in Vietnam. And there's sort of a, an effort to outline some thoughts here. But I thought it fascinating about the whole attitude of the American intelligentsia, that you would enter the week of celebrating the collapse of the Berlin Wall by putting the evacuation of the embassy in Saigon on the cover of a magazine. At a minimum, they might have had a split cover shown the wall coming down and shown the evacuation and said, which lessons matter most? And I'm going to come back to that. It's also fascinating, they have a fairly long essay by, uh, by uh, Niall Ferguson, which is uh, stunningly, I think, wrong-headed about the nature of reality. Uh, but he, say, he suggests, for example, the reverberations of the fall of the Berlin Wall turned out to be much smaller than we expected at the time. The Soviet Union disappeared. People in Poland, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, Romania, Ukraine, Georgia, live in freedom. People in Russia live in semi-freedom. Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania are independent. What, would, what, he, what he really is arguing, and this of course is the modern left's great cry about, about history, is that we did not arrive at utopia. It turned out, for example, in Russia that rich Russians had huge advantages and that KGP connected ruthless and murderous rich Russians had really big advantages. Well, that's a sad commentary on Russian history and the tragedy of Russian history. But it doesn't mean that Putin's regime is in any way comparable to Brezhnev's dictatorship. And, and to minimize the scale of change is, I think, a sign of a stunning avoidance of reality. He goes on to talk about how he argues that 1979 was the year the world really changed, and then manages not to spend any time on Pope John Paul II's visit to Poland, the nine days that we argue changed the world. Now, we didn't get there on our own. Uh, Calista and I, with Vince's help, were doing a movie with Dave Bossie and Citizens United on Ronald Reagan. And in the process of doing that movie, uh, called Rendezvous with Destiny, we interviewed Lech Wałęsa in Gdańsk, Poland, and we interviewed Václav Havel in Prague in the Czech Republic. And both of them basically said, look, freedom was a process, and the Pope was a very major component of that. In, in the case of, of uh, Havel, of uh, Wałęsa, rather, two interesting things. One is he wears an icon of the Black Madonna every day, which he began wearing, and I think this is very interesting in terms of the ACLU and the modern efforts towards uh, enforced government-imposed secularism. Uh, he began wearing in the Lenin shipyards when one of the founders of the Solidarity Movement began wearing it on the grounds that the Soviet state didn't have the nerve to go in and take it off unlike the Ninth Circuit Court in the United States. And so it became for them a symbol of their Polishness and a symbol of their religious belief. And to this day, he wears the icon of the Black Madonna every day to remind him of the relation between Catholicism, Poland, religious liberty, and the freedom of the country. In the case of Havel, who of course is a modern intellectual and a playwright of the first order, uh, he nonetheless said, in fact at one point he said, we looked up for guidance to God. And he said the Pope played a significant role. So we began digging into this, and I have to say George Weigel did a remarkable job in The Final Revolution, which is a study of the role of the church in the 80s. And I recommend anybody who wants to have a serious sense of how, how, how communism was unraveled, how secular dictatorship collapsed, and how the human spirit was reignited. I think uh, probably Weigel's The Final Revolution is as good a book as there is, and outlines the crisis of modern secular Europe, which has no moral basis on which to defend itself, uh, which he captured later in a much, very small book called uh, The Cube and the Cathedral. 
Now, in that context, as we approach the 20th anniversary, it's also totally appropriate that President Obama, who found time to go to Copenhagen for the Olympics, and who as a candidate found time to go to Berlin, couldn't quite find the time to celebrate the fall of the Berlin Wall. And I think that's totally appropriate, because in his worldview, it involves all the wrong symbols. It doesn't involve embracing Hugo Chavez. It doesn't involve appeasing Ahmadinejad. It doesn't involve denying reality about Kim Jong-il. It doesn't involve any of the patterns of appeasement and avoidance, which are the heart of this administration. That's captured, by the way, eloquently and brilliantly by Tony Dolan in a little piece in the Wall Street Journal this morning called Four Little Words, in which, as Reagan's chief speechwriter, he walks us through uh, something which Steve Hayward here at AEI has also done brilliantly in rather more than a brief article in two long volumes, uh, and something uh, which uh, Peter Schweitzer did in two books, uh, Victory and Reagan's War. And the heart of it's very simple. Reagan understood the power of moral force. Reagan understood that words really matter. And Reagan understood that confronting evil is at the heart of the survival of civilization. Now, he ended up with two people who shared that passion. One is Margaret Thatcher, and I strongly recommend Claire Berlinski's uh, remarkable work, uh, Why Margaret Thatcher Matters. Uh, Berlinski is an American novelist living in Istanbul uh, who was a graduate student at Cambridge when Thatcher was prime minister. And she has come to the conclusion that Margaret Thatcher is at the heart of the crisis of the West because she both understood how immoral and destructive socialism was, and she understood the need to break the power of the coal miners' union, and she was prepared to take whatever pain was necessary. And of course, the other great advocate of freedom in this decade was Pope John Paul II. We have, we're in, in the process of finishing a movie called Nine Days That Changed the World. And in doing the research, going back and looking at his visit, and then looking again with Weigel's other great book uh, on, on his biography of John Paul II, you really begin to understand a message of faith, uh, a message of salvation, the centrality of the cross in this whole fight. And uh, again, remember that Poland is a country which disappeared from 1793 to 1919, reappeared for 20 years, and when the Pope is a very young man, disappears again because of the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany. So the idea of Polish nationalism, of Polish liberty, of Polish independence, of the Polish right to worship is an extraordinarily intensely personal and real thing. And our thesis is pretty straightforward, that you cannot understand the explosion of human energy, which so fundamentally changes the Soviet empire, without understanding that for nine days in 1979, just one month after Thatcher was elected, and more than a year before Reagan is to be elected, that Pope John Paul II toured his home country, and in those nine days, one-third of the population of Poland came to see it. And he communicated vividly, as he put it, the thousand-year roots of Polish identity, which is the length of time Poland had been Catholic. It's an extraordinarily profound moment. And then, so as we began to dig into this, and I have to confess, Vince, who used to be here at AEI as our research director and has done an extraordinary job, uh, is now at American Solutions. Um, this has been his passion for a decade. He's going to get to talk about it in a minute. But Vince is doing this enormous amount of work. And we ran across a segment which Tony Dolan alludes to, but which I, we're going to share with you just for a minute. That How many of you have ever seen Reagan say, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall? Okay. An argument for a morally assertive, risk-taking, and forward position, which, as Dolan points out, as late as that morning, the State Department is trying to get him to take out of the speech on the grounds that it's very unpresidential. And by the way, and I want to go back. Here's a small research project we're going to do here at AEI. I want to go back and find the current documents to see how, because, because Dolan asserts that the CIA and the State Department were both saying the wall is going to be there for decades. And therefore, it's foolish for the president to set up this false expectation. Of course, the wall lasts exactly two years longer. So I think it would be very interesting just as a small case study to go back and see how stunningly timid, cowardly, and wrong the uh, bureaucracies were, um, to use Reagan-like language. Um, but in the process of this, Vince found 
the other part of the Reagan speech, which the best of my knowledge, I'll, I'll be curious how many of you ever saw this before, is so perfect in terms of both our movie and in terms of today's message. That we, this is the one thing we wanted to show you. And so can we, uh, Brady, can you, Brady is our uh, keen associate here at uh, AI who actually knows how to run the computer. <laughs> we hope. Was that too Perhaps this <laughs> gets to the root of the matter to the most fundamental distinction of all between East and West. The totalitarian world produces backwardness because it does such violence to the spirit, thwarting the human impulse to create, to enjoy, to worship. The totalitarian world finds even symbols of love and of worship an affront. Years ago, before the East Germans began rebuilding their churches, they erected a secular structure, the television tower at Alexander Platz. <coughs> Virtually ever since, the authorities have been working to correct what they view as the tower's one major flaw. Treating the glass sphere at the top with paints and chemicals of every kind. Yet even today, when the sun strikes that sphere, that sphere that towers over all Berlin, the light makes the sign of the cross. <laughs> there in Berlin, like the city itself, symbols of love, symbols of worship cannot be suppressed. As I looked out a moment ago from the Reichstag, that embodiment of German unity, I noticed words crudely spray-painted upon the wall, perhaps by a young Berliner. Quote, this wall will fall, beliefs become reality. Yes, across Europe this wall will fall, for it cannot withstand faith, it cannot withstand truth. The wall cannot withstand freedom. Do we have a picture of the... Yes. Uh, this, is the this is the Alexander Tower. The and, 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 the, and the moving picture version of this, when you see the light suddenly hit and you see the cross, you can just imagine the East Germans and the communists going sort of mildly nuts. And this happened, this, this happened every single day. I'm curious, uh, because many of you are Reagan aficionados, how many of you were aware of that section of the Berlin speech? I'm just curious. Two, three. I just find it fascinating because it strikes me, if you go out and look at you know, 20 textbooks on what happened, you're going to find remarkably few places where it says, you know, there was a fundamental underlying spiritual moral revolution underway in the process of which the Soviet dictatorship simply became utterly unacceptable. And the people were prepared to endure a decade of struggle in order to get rid of the dictatorship. And that's why I think a purely secular analysis of that era doesn't help very much and is fundamentally misleading. And I think it raises many profound questions about where we are today. What I'd like to do now is turn it over to Bob McEwen, who was intimately involved in some of these things and, and very active in uh, working on Eastern Europe and on the Soviet Union. Bob? Thank you, Newt. And please allow me to take 60 of my 600 seconds allotted here to express my gratitude on behalf of Vince as well to the two gentlemen that preceded me here. And just. Uh, to borrow three lines from President Reagan himself, who said, the American Enterprise Institute stands at the center of a revolution of ideas, that our ideas were greeted with varying degrees of scorn and hostility by what used to be called the establishment institutions. The universities, once the real home of American scholarship, have been particularly unresponsive. And so it became necessary to create our own research institutions as places where scholars could congregate and important studies could be produced that did not kowtow to the conventional wisdom. And the work of this institution, remarkably distinguished body of work, is testimony to the triumph of that think tank. The most important American scholarship comes out of our think tanks into 
of those the most influential is the American Enterprise Institute. And I would say that's due in no small part to the leadership of Chris DeMuth, and uh, I am honored to be in his company as well as to uh, accompany my friend and leader for this nation, uh, Newt Gingrich. Two quick observations about a leader. A leader is a person who knows what needs to be done next, knows why it's important, and possesses the integrity necessary to bring together the resources to accomplish the task, usually people. The strength of a nation is often made up of four parts, military, economic, it's made up of political, but also a spiritual leadership. That a nation can be strong, but with weak, immoral leadership can collapse or as there is no better example of having watched Britain sit idly by as its enemies surpassed it in strength. And then, in the, the moment when the, all of the continent is gone, the man that had said for 20 years we need to prepare for this moment, and now there was no place else to turn and nothing could be done, they called down to Chartwell, invited that man who had been excluded from government for the previous many years, they said he sat down there with his easel, and within 36 inches of that easel was more power than in all the houses of, of Westminster. But nevertheless, when the time came that now they were, they were going to collapse, they took the ball and threw it and said, Winston, how would you like to be prime minister? And he says he went to bed that night and slept the sleep of a newborn babe, content in the knowledge that finally someone was in charge that knew what they were doing. <laughs> and yet he said that... Uh, during the darkest period of the Battle of Britain in World War II, he said, with great causes, when they're on the move in the world, we learn that we are spirits, not animals, and something that is going on in space and time and beyond space and time, which whether we like it or not, spells duty. And then, as President Reagan said, America in the 1980s, having lost its way in the decade of the 70s, not unlike the same leadership we're experiencing now. I recall the, during the campaign when Mr. Reagan was running for the first time, the head of the Council of Economic Advisors for the president at that point said the question was whether or not America would have a declining standard of living in the 1980s. The question was whether or not Americans could learn to adapt to their declining standard of living. And of course, you remember that we had to learn to live with less, to, turn down our thermostats, wear our sweaters, ride our bicycles, America's coming to an end next Tuesday week and there isn't anything anybody can do about it. That was in 1981. By 1989 is what we're celebrating here today. Just eight years later, the entire world, from Moscow to Managua to Warsaw to Berlin, was chanting USA, USA, USA. Now what is that that makes that difference? He said America is in the midst of a spiritual awakening and a moral renewal. But we must never forget that no government schemes are going to per perfect man. We know that living in this world means dealing with what philosoph philosophers would call evil, or as theologians would put it, the doctrine of sin. I'm quoting the President of the United States in a speech in 1983 in Orlando, Florida. I've always maintained that the struggle now going on for the world will never be decided by bombs or rockets, by armies or military might. The real crisis we face today is a spiritual one. At root is a test of moral will and faith. I believe the source of our strength in the quest for human freedom is not material, but it is spiritual. That's what leaders understand, that they cannot prevail only with might, but by an inspiration. And so Nathan Sharansky would say, and I will quote his explanation of the story that we all know so well. He said Reagan's challenge to the Soviet was as much moral as it was economic, which is why the impact of his policies on the life of Soviet dissidents was no less dramatic. One day, my Soviet jailers gave me the privilege of reading the latest copy of Pravda, and splashed across the front page was a condemnation of President Reagan for having the temerity to call the Soviet Union an evil empire. Tapping on walls and talking through toilets, word of Reagan's provocation quickly spread throughout the prison, and the dissidents became ecstatic. Finally, the leader of the free world had spoken the truth, a truth that burned inside the hearts of every one of us. And so we acknowledge the, the time just 35 minutes ago, the former president of Poland 
was invited to begin to push the dominoes that are stretched across Berlin this evening, a mile and a half long, the dominoes that represent what happened when one people began to stand up. And it was in August of 1989, after having t eight years of having a strike. Now the strike that was going on, they understood rather than just to rebel, they, they would perform the example I use is when you ask your teenagers to clean the garage. And there's lots of activity going on, but nothing really happens. <laughs> and so uh, they, they decided that they would just bring the economy to a halt. And through a series of negotiations that would make a tremendous, interesting uh, story on their, on their own, it became apparent that the day had come when they could conceivably choose a non-communist leader of a communist country, something that had never happened since the Bolsheviks had shot their way into power in November of 1917. And for those who are subject to the normal history books, let me remind you, that was not against the Tsar. The Tsar had abdicated earlier in the year, but against the Republic under Kerensky, who died in New York in 1970. And once they took power at the barrel of a gun, nobody had ever been able to overcome it. And in meeting with, with Lech Wałęsa and Gdansk, he asked that we attend the same in Warsaw when they go to make this decision because it's possible that they could roll the tanks and not permit it to happen, fearing that if a, non if a country can choose a non-communist leader and nothing happens, that it would unravel the entire system. Well, I got involved in government for two reasons, because I loved America and I hated communism, and I still bristled at the fact that in 1956, when those dear Hungarians stood up, no one came to their aid. Or in 1968, when the Prague Spring was being crushed, no one said or did anything to help them, but now <laughs> I was in Warsaw as a member of Congress, and if they were going to roll the tanks, I was going to be there. And so in sitting there and watching that vote take place, they then froze after having chosen the leader, and no one knew what to do next. And I personally was jumping out of my skin. And so I uh, was elbowing my wife how great this was. This is the greatest thing. Either they roll the tanks in 24 hours, or communism is a political force, and the world is dead. This is when somebody ought to applaud, do something. <laughs> so she said, why don't you? I said, I can do that. I started to applaud. They started to applaud. We started to celebrate. But then we knew the next morning when Tudos Masovieski, the fellow that spent six of the previous eight years in jail, the editor of the Solidarity newspaper, who is now going to be prime minister, that he shouldn't go in there alone. And so we were privileged to escort him, five of us, Bob and, and Elizabeth Dole, Bob and Liz McEwen, and Senator Deaconcini to go in with him. And we walked into the chancellery where he stood and looked around and said, you know, I've never been in there before. But he's now the prime minister. We, I gave him a flag that had flown over the Capitol. Elizabeth Dole, the cabinet member, gave a letter from the president. President and Senator Deaconcini said, we're going to pray for you, uh, Mr. Prime Minister. And he didn't even wait for the end of, uh, of the translation. He just turned and he said, that's what we've been robbed of for these last 45 years. That's what this nation needs. And then the dominoes began to go, August, September, October, until November 9th, the wall came down and the lesson was given to the world that freedom can and will conquer. Moments ago, walking across the Brandenburg Gate, arm in arm with, with Mr. Gorbachev, Chancellor Angela Merkel said, this is not just a day of celebration for Germans. This is a day of celebration for the whole of Europe. Indeed, this is a day of celebration for all of those people who love freedom and who now have more of it. And so when Berlin was divided into four sectors, uh, the representatives of those sectors are there in that the chancellor of the nation, Madame Merkel is there. The president of the French Republic, Mr. Sarkozy is there. The prime minister of Great Britain, Gordon Brown is there. And the president of the United States is I know not where. November 9th, this day, 1954. Seven blocks from here, President Eisenhower concluded an address to the Con Conference on Spiritual Foundations of American Democracy when he said this. I don't think anyone needs a great deal of credit for believing in what seems to be so obvious. This relationship between our spiritual faith and our form of government. So obvious that we should really not need to identify a man as unusual who recognizes it. Our whole theory of government finally expressed in our declaration said man is endowed by his creator. When you come back to it, there's just one thing. Man is worthwhile because he was born in the image of God. Freedom is nothing in the world but a spiritual conviction that each of us is enormously valuable because of a certain standing that was given by God himself. Any group 
that awakens all of us to this simple truth is in my mind a patriotic group, one that can well take the Bible in one hand and the flag in the other and march forward. That's what AEI does. That's what uh, the leaders of, of American Solutions do. And that's why I am honored to participate in this remembrance of a day that for those who love tyranny, a day that shall live in infamy, when indeed the entire world said freedom wins. With that, Vince, I believe you're next, and then we'll take questions after you. OK, fine. Thanks, Bob. And uh, thank you, Chris and Newt, for letting me speak today. Um, You know, we're speaking today about the, the spiritual sources that led to the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, we certainly recognize that there are many diplomatic, military, economic uh, uh, contributions to the fall of the Berlin Wall. They are much easier to, to measure. You can measure throw weights of nuclear arms. You can measure GDP. You can talk about the, the impact of the U.S. deliberate U.S. strategy on, on oil to crash the price of oil and how that contributed. But here we're focused on spiritual sources. And these are far harder to measure. And at the end of the day, at the end of the day, will be a bit of a mystery how those dominoes of individuals uh, fell on one another to create this uh, enormous change in Eastern Europe. And as a as a bookend uh, to my my quick brief talk, uh, are two dates: June 1978 and June of 2009. 31 years apart. In June of 2000, uh, 1978, uh, the writer of the Gulag Archipelago, I can't even pronounce it. Uh, the, the Alexander Zolzhenitsyn goes to Harvard University and he gives it a dr an address called The World Split Apart. And this is somebody who experienced the horror of the Soviet labor camps firsthand and wrote about it. And he was in exile in the United States. Uh, Chris DeMuth was president at that address. And what did he say? He lamented the loss of courage. He, he, he described the loss of courage as the most defining aspect of life in the West. He talked about uh, the, the lack of a belief in the supreme being that would, in a sense, rally the West to defend itself against an evil on the march. He said what would be required would be a spiritual blaze in order to meet these threats. And he said the only way we have, the only thing that we can do is to look upward. That's how he closed his address. And in June of 2009, you had in the heart of the square where John Paul II had his first mass during that nine-day pilgrimage in, in, in 79, 30 years after that mass, you had the mayor of Warsaw, the president of Poland, a company of 50 soldiers erecting a cross, a 30-foot cross in the same spot where that mass took place, giving ingratitude for the words of John Paul, for his message that led to their liberation. The, the country of Poland, through that ceremony, um, made it very clear what they believe led to the fall of the wall and to their own liberation. But let me just, in, in this brief talk, here's the scope, and that is uh, spiritual renewal in Poland was a long program uh, started after the war by the Catholic Church in Poland. It culminated most vividly in 1979 during the, the, the pilgrimage of, of Pope John Paul II, and then through the 79-89 period grew in courage. Um, but it's key to remember that it didn't just happen in 79, it was, it was the, the nine-day pilgrimage uh, by Pope John Paul II rallied people in a way that, that had not been rallied before, but there was a period of renewal. And why is that important? In the Second World War, I want to just give you an, a couple facts. Six million Poles died or were killed. Almost a fifth of the population of a pre-war population of 35 million. Of this six million figure, 2.9 million were Polish Jews. After the Nazi invasion of 1939, the Nazis murdered almost 2,000 priests, six bishops, 850 monks, 300 nuns, 113 seminarians, and 15 other priests survived the concentration camps, and church property was destroyed across the country. So when we talk about spiritual renewal, we're talking about the renewal of an institution and of, and of, of individuals uh, in the face of such overwhelming evil. And keep in mind that the Polish people, in a sense, lost the Second World War twice. They lost it in 1939, when they were invaded on the East and the West, and ultimately lost it in 1945, when Yalta uh, uh, made it such that the Poles were going to have to live in, a, in communism. So it was renewal in that context that uh, the new primate, Stefan Wyszynski, Wyszynski um, which we talk about in the, in the movie, he takes over as primate of Poland. And, and the primate of Poland um, is an office that's unique to the Polish Catholic Church. For hundreds of years in Poland, when there was no king, the primate, the leader of the Catholic Church in Poland, would in a sense be the, the primate, the leader between kings. So he had an historical role to fill. 
And in the, in, the, in the midst of this devastation, he sought maneuvering room for the church, just a livable space. But the communists were intent on destroying the church in Poland. And uh, they tried to have authority over the naming of bishops. They took over property. Um, uh, you know, they, they uh, put, put bishops in prison. Um, what ultimately happened, the, the church refused, Wyszynski refused to be accommodated to um, Soviet leadership of the church, control of the church, uh, and was put in prison for three years under house arrest from 1953 to 1956. Well, what happened was there was tremendous labor unrest that ultimately the, the communist authorities thought they needed the, the primate to come back to Warsaw to become primate again, and that would um, keep the, the unrest down. Uh, Wyszynski agreed to do that only on the condition that the church uh, would have this livable space, that the bishops, the priests would be released from prison, that property would be restored, the church could maintain some self-governance, and that happened. But still, under the, the communists, constant harassment took place on the church, everything from not providing ink to the, the Catholic newspapers, uh, taxes, all the things that a overweening government does to, uh, to uh, disfavor certain activities. When he was in house arrest, under house arrest, Wyszynski had this idea, and this is one key aspect of the renewal in Poland that took place. He had the idea that in, the, in 1966, so nine years hence, was going to be the thousandth anniversary of Polish Christianity. And to understand this great novena which he created, uh, novena in the, in the Catholic Church is nine days of, typically nine days of prayer, uh, seeking grace on behalf of a, uh, an intention. He thought, let's do a nine-year novena, culminating in the thousandth anniversary of Polish Christianity. And what would happen during this nine-year novena? They would take the icon of the Black Madonna, which is a, an icon, a painting of the, the Virgin Mary, that has been in Poland since I think the 13th century, 14th century, uh, and has been a symbol of Polish freedom, independence. In 1655, when the Swedes invaded from the north, uh, they got as far as Czestochowa, where, is the, where the monastery that holds the Black Madonna is located. And there, at Czestochowa, they were able to rebuff the invasion. So in the Polish understanding of itself, the Black Madonna is a defender of Poland. And so during this great nine-year novena, Cardinal Wyszynski had the idea, well, let's take the Black Madonna on the road. Let's go to every parish in the country, and then over this nine-year period, we will, in a sense, revivify, make more lively the Polish understanding of its history, its Catholic identity, this, this symbol which had been um, um, so important in its defense against outside aggressors would now become a symbol against a, 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 a inside um, uh, aggressor that was uh, uh, taking over the life of the country. And so they would take this icon parish to parish and there would be programs at each parish of prayer uh, and instruction. And this culminated over nine years. Ultimately, in 1966, a, a mass for one million people reconsecrating the country to the Virgin Mary. And this had a tremendous impact on the people. The communist state was trying to say, we have a thousand years of the Polish state. <laughs> and yet the Catholic Church says, no, it's not a thousand years of the Polish state. It's a thousand years of the Polish nation defined by its Christian identity. That took place. It, it, it had an enormous impact on the people. There are other aspects of renewal that uh, if you want to learn more about, you just open this book by George Weigel and you can find all about it. Uh, but one other important renewal movement was the Oasis movement, Light and Life movement. And this was a movement that started in the mid-70s of Polish young people who, when faced with this challenge of living in a communist system where the reports on television every day were full of lies, uh, they said, look, we can contribute to the revival of our nation by living more fully in the truth. If we don't compromise, if we have enough Poles that have enough courage to, uh, to live in truth, then there's more of us than there are of them. Uh, this had a tremendous impact on the people. Over the course of 10 years, from the mid-70s, 1980s, 40% of the uh, vocations to the priest in Poland came out of this movement. I want to jump <clears throat> to 1979. I've just abbreviated 30 years of history that has tremendous depth. Um, you know, for a lot of people who can't, even American Catholics like myself who don't fully understand the nature of Polish piety, um, it, it is difficult to access. But this period of living space for the church, renewal, not only renewal in the church, renewal of the Polish national identity, 
culminated in the Pope's visit in 1979. He gets elected four months after Zoltsinitsa makes his famous address about a loss of courage. And what does he say in his opening mass in Rome? He says, not, do not be afraid, open your hearts to Christ. Now, um, in the course of our documentary, we interviewed a number of people, and I, I'll go right to this comment by the former president of the Italian Senate, Marcello Pera, who uh, himself is uh, quite a commenter on the, the current scene in, in, in Europe and issues of secularism, moral relativism. And he himself, I don't even believe, is a, is a Christian. I think he identifies himself as an agnostic. But he said to us in, in, in May of this year that, in his belief, it was the cross as carried by John Paul II that led to the fall of communism in Poland and then elsewhere. And you ask yourself, why is that? Well, in the Christian understanding, if you look upon the cross of Christ, that is a symbol of what people, as in John Paul's formulation, he says, and I'll get to this comment in his opening mass, he says, man can't understand himself except through Jesus Christ. It's not only that God reveals himself to Christ, but, but Christ reveals the, the, the extent of what man can be. Therefore, you can sacrifice. Man can sacrifice like Christ. You know, this is a Christian way of proposing courage and sacrifice. And I would say in, in Ronald Reagan's opening, uh, his, his inaugural address in uh, January of 1981, what did he do when he closed the address? He talked about a private, Martin Trepto, who uh, in 1917 was carrying a telegram between enemy lines and was ultimately killed but was found with a pledge in his pocket and his pledge was I pledge to struggle to work America must win this war I will do everything I can as if the whole battle depends upon me alone well Ronald Reagan didn't talk about a cross but he talked about heroic action by individuals that can make a difference in the life of the nation and, and in terms of freedom so I want to jump to June 79 uh, the Pope arrives after eight months in office, and I want to go to three quotes in his opening uh, homily on Victory Square, which you have in your packet. <clears throat> and these, I think, help illustrate um, the impact of the, the Pope's visit. He, he is speaking to the Poles, the Poles who, as I mentioned, suffered grievously both during the Second World War and now under 30 years of communism, a dreary life, economic troubles. And he talks about how the church brought Christ to Poland, which is the key, as I said, to understanding this great and fundamental reality, which is man. He goes on in this vein, he says that man cannot understand who he is, nor what his proper dignity is, nor his vocation or final de destiny. He cannot understand any of this without Christ. And then he adds this, this is why Christ cannot be excluded from man's history anywhere in the world. Now, in a country that had suffered constant harassment by an atheistic state, everything from taking churches, taking crosses off walls to harassing uh, people who tried to have a career uh, for their Christian faith, this had an enormous impact. What was the result? People started to clap, and the Pope waited. And this goes on. They clap more. They clap for 14 minutes. And during the clapping, they started to sing. And they sang in Latin, Christus Regna. Christi, oh, Christus Vincent, Christus Regna, Christus Imperat. Christ conquers, Christ reigns, Christ rules. Now, what an a affirming uh, statement that the state is not supreme in Poland, but God is supreme. And we have many people in our movie uh, who describe the impact of this, this 14, 14 minutes of, uh, of applause. Uh, a Polish theologian described this as the great lifting of fear that had kept people isolated during the communist period. The, the second quote I want to uh, mention, and, and we have this, I think, captured very well in our movie and some of the footage that we've gotten. You can actually, we have actually the singing taking place. Um, <clears throat> in a country that could not talk about the enormous sacrifice that was paid by Polish patriots to defend, its, defend the city of Warsaw, uh, the Warsaw Uprising killed over 200,000 people, 15,000 Polish Home Army soldiers and 200,000 civilians. This was in August 1944, and they took up a battle against the Nazi occupiers in anticipation that the Soviet army would come from the east and that the Polish nation would be able to meet the Soviets as a defender of their own city. Well, what happened? The Polish, the Russian army, Soviet army stopped on the other side of the river and waited while the Nazis killed over 215,000 people. And they were never able to remember these, these patriots during the Cold War period. The, the communists didn't want any notice of what had transpired by the home army. 
in 2004, only in 2004, did they dedicate a Warsaw Uprising Museum in Warsaw. So for this whole period, they weren't allowed to talk about it. And so what, in that context, he says, and you can read it here, it was impossible to understand the city of Warsaw, the capital of Poland, which in 1944, the Warsaw Uprising, decided to engage in an uneven battle with the invader. In, ba in a battle which she was abandoned by the Allied powers, a battle in which she was fell under her own ruins. And then this most meaningful line, if we do not remember that under these same ruins lies Christ, the Redeemer with his cross from the front of the church, and I can't pronounce it, but in Krakowski, a street very close by. <laughs> and you have a picture of that. When I first read that, I didn't realize it was referring to actually a specific cross. But there's a street close by, the Church of the Holy Cross, has about a six-foot statue of Christ, and it was lying in the rubble. Now when he said those words, again, words referring to things that were not often talked about in Polish life, the crowd started to sing a, a Polish hymn about wanting God in the schools, wanting God in the textbooks, wanting God at home and in the workplace. <clears throat> you can imagine the drama of a million people singing this, and you can only imagine what the communist authorities must have felt like seeing this on television. And I might add there, and parenthetically, about the television. Um, the movie that's coming out in three weeks, we, we're taking advantage of some wonderful television footage. But it wasn't television footage taken, taken by Polish state television. Somehow the Polish bishops anticipated that Polish state television, as it did, was going to go narrowly on the Pope and not cover anything else. So that people wouldn't have a sense of what the reception was, the clapping, the participation. And in fact, it's exactly what you did. I, have, I had the occasion to see Polish state television, and it's exactly that. You would have no idea of what the impact would be. And so the Polish bishops um, got cameras, got footage, gave it to the best Polish cameramen. They went out. They got wonderful footage, great screen sh uh, wide angle shots, and we have some of that footage. But I want to come to the close of the Pope's homily, which George Weigel said it was probably the sermon of his lifetime. This, this Mass is taking place on the eve of Pentecost, which of course in the Christian understanding is the time when the, the 12 apostles are gathering in fear because their teacher, their friend, has just been murdered by the Roman authorities and they're not sure what they're going to do. And that is of course when the Holy Spirit, when Christ comes and brings the Holy Spirit down to give them courage and to go out. So this is taking place on the Saturday before Pentecost Sunday. And the Pope is speaking in front of a 50-foot cross with a red stole around it a red pastoral stole. And he's, and he's closing this homily, and he's closing it with a prayer. And the prayer is for the Holy Spirit to descend. But as he, as he, as he says this, and I, there's so much depth to this, 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 is a, this is a Polish Pope who himself was an actor and studied acting, um, and a, a participated in underground acting theater as a young man, 19 years old, because he thought the greatest resistance to the Nazi terror was to sustain Polish culture. So he risked his life actually taking part in the theater group because the thought was that this th in this theater group was that the spoken word actually was a weapon. The spoken word done forcefully and the right way could penetrate the lies. So in the movie, you'll see, he is speaking slowly and he's saying, I, a son of Polish soil, and at the same time, John Paul II, the Pope, I call from the depth of a thousand years of Polish Christianity, not 30 years of the communist state, a thousand years of Polish Christianity, I call on the eve of Pentecost. I call together with everyone assembled, a million people, two million on the outskirts. Let your spirit descend, let your spirit descend, and renew the face of the earth. And there's a pause, and to understand this properly in, in Polish, which I do not speak, but just know this, the, the word for earth is ziemi. But it also means more than just the earth, like the, the biblical verse, renew the face of the earth. It also means soil, it means land, it means country. So when he's saying it, he's making a play on words. Let your spirit descend, he says it again, and renew the face of the earth, pause, this earth. It was not lost on anybody. He was talking about Poland. He was calling on a prayer to change the face of Poland. Everybody we interviewed talked about the overwhelming impact that not only the, the, the homily itself, the whole nine days, but especially this prayer uh, to change the face of Poland. And as one Polish monk we interviewed said, he goes, look, don't, don't be disillusioned. Not everybody became a saint overnight. Not everybody became a saint, but there was no question that the, the Poland was renewed uh, as a result of these nine days. Um, the Pope goes on to visit several other cities. He, uh, he finishes in Warsaw. I'd urge you to read the, some of the comments in Warsaw. But it was the impact of this visit that ultimately leads within 10 years, or excuse me, 14 months, 
to 10 million members of Solidarity. And Solidarity members will tell you the same thing, that they had tried with the free trade union movement in the 70s to, to have a popular membership, and they only got several hundred. Within 14 minutes, months after the, the visit of the Pope, you had 10 million. Um, if you had any idea whether Solidarity was thinking about the Pope's visit, Lech Wałęsa signs the accords that recognize the independent trade union movement with a big, gaudy memento pen from the 1979 visit with a big plume at the top, and it's big and thick. That's what he signed the accords with. On the gates of the, of the Lenin shipyard, they had an um, icon of the Black Madonna, Holy Father, picture of the Holy Father. Uh, everyone will tell you that had an impact, and of course we know a little bit about the history from then on. So when we understand the fall of the Berlin Wall, it's not just about a spokesperson for the Communist Party of Berlin who slipped up in an afternoon. It goes much, much deeper than that uh, to include the 40 years of renewal in the Catholic Church in Poland in those nine days in June of 79. Vince, Bob, Newt, thank you all very much.